Good evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Still feel free to wait um, for your drink at the bar. You're in the room, so you should be able to hear me. Um, my name is Luis de Ayub, and I'm director of the Fellows Program here at New America. Um, this event is part of a 20th anniversary series that we're hosting throughout the course of this year. For those who don't know, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, 1999, we were founded as a radical think tank here in D.C. that was willing to reach outside of the Beltway to figure out new ways to do that, and books and films became an avenue in which we could do that. 20 years later, that vision has resulted in the publication of 116 books, um, over 200 fellows, and we've supported nine films in, in addition to several long-form reporting articles as well. Um, Chris's book came out this year and is actually 114 on our list of 116, so a good number to have, I think, um, if you ask me. Um, so as I introduce the speakers, just want to go over two housekeeping notes. Um, we do have a live stream happening this evening, so please wait for the microphone when you do ask a question. Um, and more importantly, we do have books on sale. Um, our selling partner, Solid State Books, is here tonight, so please be sure to buy a copy of the book this evening, and Chris will be available afterward to sign copies. Um, so with that, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Um, Christopher Leonard is a Class of 2014 National Fellow and a business reporter whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and Bloomberg Business Week. He's the author of two books, two books, The Meat Racket and Copeland, um, which won the Anthony, uh, J. Anthony Lucas Prize um, for work in progress from the New York Times, um, or from Columbia, and is also a New York Times bestseller, um, reaching the list this summer. Um, Chris is joined by Franklin Four. He's a class of 2016 National Fellow and a national correspondent for The Atlantic. He's also the author of the acclaimed book, How Soccer Explains the World, which is one of my favorite books, um, by the way, um, as well as The World Without Mind, which is a book that we actually helped support through his fellowship. Um, so with that, I'll turn the conversation over to you, Frank. Well, um, thank you. It's, um, it's a real honor to be here and to be with you because as, um, I think as a journalist, I kind of, I look at what you did here with incredible Ah, just at the um, that that it, this is not. First of all, it's not an easy story to tell because you're dealing with a company that is, that we'll discuss in a minute is in many ways a very diffuse company, and a company that I think uh, pretty clearly intentionally tries to obscure its footprint. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I think it's it's important to have a program like the Fellows Program where you, you're able to kind of cover. Um, the, the market gap in journalism, which doesn't permit you to engage in this sort of, uh, one, to engage in this sort of massive reporting project. Um, they're very, it, it's just such a, such a uh, painstaking um, process to go through. So I thought maybe one place we could start is look around the room. Um, what are the things in this physical space that could be traced to Coke Industries? OK, it's going to be a long list. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and actually, uh, before I answer that, if I could, you yeah. really pointed out how long this book took to report and to write. And it simply would not have been possible without New America. Um, I, and, and I want to take the moment to say thank you so much to this institution for everything it's done. It is impossible for me to articulate the level of support. I mean, New America gave me years. It sheltered me for years and gave me total independence to work on this book. And without that, I mean, you talk about the gap in the marketplace. Without somebody stepping in to fill that breach, this type of journalism, I, I just know it wouldn't have happened for me. And I think that that's the case for a lot of other fellows. So from the bottom of my heart, New America, thank you. It's just amazing. It wouldn't have happened without New America. So yeah, thank you. Um, that being said, so this room, um, you know, it sounds like I'm over advertising the reach of this company, but they definitely, uh, if they didn't make the specific carpet, they make carpets just like this. They make the plastics that are in the chair. They make the fibers that are in our clothing, uh, in, in elastic waistbands, in, 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 in nylon, in spandex. They 
are playing a role in the delivery of uh, the electricity that's on right now, whether it's buying and selling natural gas supplies that fire up a, a plant, whether you know they were very involved in trading actual electricity hours in California. They are a major player in the energy infrastructure that's hidden from our view, uh, but that keeps the lights running right now. So I'd say other than like our clothing, the building materials in the wall, the insulation panels, you probably see Georgia Pacific logos on office buildings under construction all the time. I know I do, but I'm also kind of obsessed with the whole thing. But uh, the wall panels, the insulation, the, the timber framing, and then, you know, finally, the, the food we're eating. And Coke plays there in a really interesting way. They're one of the largest global producers of nitrogen fertilizer, which is something that you don't think you buy, but it is literally the bedrock of our food system. So they are making billions of dollars and, and having a major influence at that sort of foundational level of our food system. As you were digging in and you were kind of unfolding this entity, was there something, was there a moment you said, holy cow, Coke Industries makes that? Is there something so far afield that they do? Because everything you're describing is quite sprawling. Yeah, um, it happened a lot. Uh, the phones, they make the sensors in our phones. They bought this company called Molex, and they make sensors that are in the door of your car and that, that sense the speed in your car and that are in your phones. So that's an area where I didn't think that they would be at all. How many people work for Coke Industries? Oh, man, that's a hard question. I mean, honestly, it's like it's over 100,000 um, spread around the world. And yet, um, you know, despite that, that reach, despite the omnipresence, despite the fact that we're consuming Coke things all the time, it just, it's, we, there's, there's no awareness of it. I mean, people are so much, more, I mean, we, we read about Coke in the newspaper, it usually has to do with politics yes. and not the things that they make. Yes. Okay. That is key to the whole institution and it's key to the whole book. And I can describe the reasons for it. But, you know, first of all, to back up, we're talking about their size, we're talking about their scale, we're talking about a reach into our lives. That's really important. But also, as an author, what drew me to this is, is how they are spread across our entire economy. If you're talking about the U.S. economic system and our politics, Coke can encompass the whole thing. You can write about all of it by writing about this firm. I mean, that's how broadly dispersed and, and deeply embedded in the system they are, which is what drew me to it. And then the second thing is exactly what you talked about. Nobody knows about this stuff, yeah. okay? And, and part of that is because of Coke's strategy. And I'm sure we'll talk about this, but secrecy and privacy is key to the whole enterprise. Part of that is personal about how Charles Koch approaches life, but part of it is really deeply strategic. But, but also, you know, for example, Coke isn't publicly traded. So there's not a stock price to bounce around every day and get talked about on CNBC, which is very attracted to the shiny object. That doesn't mean that Coke's not important. I mean, it's, it's, it's vitally economically important, but they're just not trying to get attention. And, and to me, that's really important. I remember, um, you know, one of the great people I met at New America was Lena Khan. And we used to talk all the time about stuff like this. And in, in terms of what's going on in the world, there's this quadrant of things that are important and things that are boring, mm -hmm. okay? Coke is down in this corner of super important and super boring. <laughs> Oil refineries, pipeline networks, commodities trading, nitrogen fertilizer production. Uh, David and Charles Coke, as you know, David Coke passed away. They're two of the richest people in America, not coincidentally. But they're, they're simply not trying to get attention. By being involved in these hyper-complex, boring industries that underpin civilization, they're making a, a, a massive fortune, and they're influencing our lives. Yet your book is the most boring thriller ever written. Yeah. <laughs> or thrilling borer ever <laughs> written. Um, let's, I, I, I want to just weave the discussion of tradecraft into the whole evening, but I'll just begin here. So when you set out to write about this company, um, you probably had an instinct that a lot of what they do would be a snooze fest if not um, narrated in the right sort of way. What were the choices that you made at the very beginning of the project that kind of tried to um, 
tried to tell the story of something important yet diffuse in 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 some ways. I mean, there is a center to the book, right? Right. Which is Charles Koch, and Charles we'll talk Koch. about him. But he's um, and he's he's probably boring, fascinating as well. <laughs> um, what what were the? How did you start to, to conceive of the project at the start in order to make it? jump off the page in the way that it does. Wow, okay. And by the way, now we're going back to like 2012. So let me dust off the cobwebs and remember, first of all, as a writer and as a reporter and as a reader, I actually get really geeked out about this boring stuff because I have this theory that if you can take these things that are so vitally important to people and the writer's job is to mine through miles and miles of tedium and horrific, boring material to come at the super important spark at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. For example, Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, is like the textbook example of somebody who took collateralized debt obligation and helped explain why this destroyed the economy and is fundamental to modern American finance. So in the beginning, I, I became obsessed and fascinated with oil refining. Mm -hmm. Super important part of the world, the economy, the country, tells such an important story about our political system and, and how people make fortunes. And so to me, the, it was exciting to learn about it. And I realized if I could distill it down to the real essence that people don't talk about. If you've got the guts to get the machete and go through the brush for months and get to the real story, you can bring it out in a way that's going to be interesting to people. But then the honest truth is, as I started reporting it, I wanted to learn how things worked. I wanted to learn what Coke Industries really was, how they really operate, how they really think, and what they really do. And that's when I started interviewing people. And people have this way of just being fascinating. And so these stories started to really come forward, which um, totally changed my conception of, of, of the whole institution and the whole history. And, and that's when it started to jump off the page, if you will, and become why, super why, why fascinating. Why don't you just uh, pause and yeah. give us an example of a person that you discovered yeah. who you found especially beguiling and who opened up the company in the way that you're describing. Thank you so much, because this person is like jumping out of my head. So in the very beginning, I'm calling around to everybody who's ever worked at Coke Industries. And I also want to talk to people who used to be senior at Coke Industries. And I'm literally going down a list. And so you literally, at the beginning of the project, you just you compiled a spreadsheet of names and then just started calling? I wish I could say I'm sophisticated enough to have a spreadsheet. Yeah. I have like these like a yellow legal pad with yellow names. <laughs> legal pads and scribbled stuff everywhere and these Microsoft Word documents that make sense to me but don't make sense to anybody else. Well, it means Coke can't hack them, so. Yes. And actually, that's a real thing. I won't go there now, but that's a real thing. We'll uh, return to that. Bracket that. Bracket. Return to it later. And so one of the random names on this list was Bernard J. Paulson, former senior oil refining executive at Coke, who I reach at home. And he's, um, I think he was in his late 70s or early 80s. And he just starts talking. How do you, how do you present yourself to somebody like Bernard J. Paulson? Uh, hello, my name is Christopher Leonard. I'm a business reporter. I am writing about Coke Industries, and I'd love to interview you about your time with the company. And before they can hang up on me, I try to rush in with an informed question. I, I wanted to ask you about the 80s when they bought the refinery uh, in Corpus Christi because I heard that there was a lot of dissent about that deal, but it went through and you were in charge of it. Well, then all of a sudden they're like, oh. Well, yeah, you got that wrong, though, because, like, I, you know, I did this or did that. So you're, like, instantly kind of telegraphing, I'm genuinely inter interested in the substance, and I know a thing or two kind of thing. So anyway, Paulson starts talking to me, and he's like, well, yeah, it reminds me of the time Charles Koch hired me to break the union up in uh, Pine Bend, <laughs> Minnesota. Disco. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, like, sweat breaks out on my forehead. And I, and I said, well, please do tell me about that, you know? And so an hour later, he had unspooled this amazing story that like, truly was lost to history about this very uh, brutal, bitter labor war that Charles Koch undertook. And he picked a fight uh, when he was in his 30s, right after he'd taken over the family company. 
And he hired Bernard Paulson, this like six foot six Texan guy who wore cowboy boots, to go up and break the back of this militant labor union in, in, in uh, Minnesota. So that, that became a huge chapter in the book, which helped, I think, me understand what labor unions were like back in the 70s, mm -hmm. what working conditions were like for blue collar workers at an oil refinery in the 70s, and what the dispute was like, and it also revealed to me a lot about Charles Coates' character. So there's, there's a case of a story where all of a sudden you're just talking to a person, and, and the stories just come out. How would you manage a source like Paulson? Would you, you have this initial conversation with him on the phone, and then would you just keep talking to him on the phone? Would you go visit Paulson in person? Would you, uh, how do you, how do you, um, how did you, op I mean, it sounds like he opened up pretty much instantly, but how did you, um, what was your strategy for kind of milking him for all he was worth? Well, <laughs> of course we collaborated jointly on a synergistic project, and no, but the way I, I, I milked him for all he was worth was um, called him back and asked him more questions that had come up. If I had more, frankly, if I was more resourced up, I would have flown to Houston, but you know, you've always got to figure out uh, how to use resources, and I didn't have that kind of resources at my command. But then I went to the Library of Congress and verified what he was telling me with the old newspaper clippings from mm. the Minneapolis papers and the St. Paul papers, which are in like a Raiders of the Lost Ark style crate <laughs> in the bottom and not digitized. And then when I realized he was telling me the truth and it was verifiable, I flew to the actual refinery mm. and then interviewed all the old-time union people to flesh out the other side of the story. And I think, um, you know, one, in the green room, um, you, were, you were mentioning that you, you, take, you took a trip to Houston and yeah. you were literally just knocking on doors. When you went to Pine Bluff, was that what you were doing there? You were, you, were you just, I mean, it, I think it's people don't realize, no, maybe, maybe not in Pine Bluff, but, um, <laughs> no. No, but this kind of shoe leather Part of it is is like seems so antiquated in the age of the internet, perhaps or Google, but it's actually vital. Yeah, reporting doesn't happen without it. The reason I made that funny face is, yeah, I went up to. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it's Pine Bend. Oh, Pine Bend. I'm sorry if I said that. So I went no, up no, to no, Pine Bend. Me. I had a couple a couple phone call contacts set up of people mm -hmm. I knew I could visit, and then I spent I did spend the rest of the time knocking on doors and meeting people in diners and might have kind of walked into a nursing home behind somebody without buzzing in and knocked on a door and got an incredible interview with a guy who used to be a manager at the refinery. And so, but really, truly, honestly, the point is you cannot do reporting, I think, without that. And it's, it's, we live in an extremely fraught era in the media world, in the political world, in our literal communities. And it is somewhat creepy and invasive and aggressive to knock on somebody's door. And so I dress like this, you know, and you show You always up. wear the tie? Uh, yeah. And particularly if I'm doing door work, because you want to telegraph to somebody, I'm not a creep, I'm like on the job. I'm on the clock. And what, what conveys that better than wearing a tie, you know? And so um, but you really do try to knock on daylight hours, instantly say, look, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, and I really do want to know about this. Would you be willing to talk to me about this? And if they say I'm not interested, thank you so much, I, do, I really appreciate it. You can't be creepy and aggressive, but unless you try to connect with people, unless you try to connect with people, you can't understand what's going on, is my view. Yeah. So it it's, strikes me there are two central characters in the book. One is something, it's a concrete human being, and then we'll get to the second one in a, in a second. The most concrete human, I mean, the, the, con the human being who ties it all together is, of course, Charles Koch. Um, and one question I, I, I had, this is a, a bit abstract, but I was thinking, you know, what is this, what, hang, what keeps this corporation hanging together in one piece? What is this corporation? And it seems it's an extension of one man um, above all else. Yeah. 
absolutely. Um, I didn't know that going in. I had no idea. Uh, I knew this company was a big, big company that could let me report on all the stuff I cared about. This figure at the heart of it didn't start to emerge until months into the reporting when I realized Charles Koch, okay, the CEO of a corporation is, is like a dictator. Um, they are accountable to the board of directors, but other than that, they have the authority to hire, fire, and direct strategy. This is an, like a democracy. Charles Koch, incidentally, appoints the board. The only person who can fire Charles Koch is Charles Koch. He has been CEO of this organization since 1967 when Lyndon Johnson was president. Mm -hmm. That's over 50 years. He is the unquestioned authority at the top of the whole system. Okay, so that's pretty rare. And you asked me if there was this, sort of this aha moment when I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't think they were into that. Mm -hmm. What came to my mind was a little bit different. Um, I was at DuPont Circle reading on a nice day uh, this book he had written called The Science of Success that he published in 2007, which is Charles Koch's management philosophy, although that's such a simplistic term. It doesn't capture what it really is. It is his blueprint for how to organize a company, how to organize a country, and how to live your personal life. And there's a bar code thing that, that lays that all out in Science of Success. And I was reading that book, and I was just like, Jesus, this thing is so much more than a company. This, th I, I, this is like a, a true internal mini society. This is different from Walmart. This is different from General Electric. This is different from Tyson Foods, which I'd written a book about. The people who work for Coke subscribe to this philosophy, speak this vocabulary, and, and follow these rules that Charles Koch has, has codified in this market-based management system to a degree unlike any other I've ever seen. Okay. Well, let's unpack this because yeah. uh, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about Coke Industries and Charles Koch is what you're describing, that it's, it's, we think about Coke as an ideologue, and ideologues can sometimes have totalizing philosophies, and there is this kind of totalizing philosophy at the core that extends into almost every aspect of the company, of his life, and of his politics. And so maybe you could just, you could, you could, you could, you could give us the contours of that. Absolutely. Okay, so let's start very quickly. Charles Koch is born in Wichita, Kansas. His dad is Fred Koch. His dad is a millionaire who owns this industrial conglomerate. Fred Koch has four sons. Charles Koch is one of them. Fred Koch was a co-founder of the John Birch Society. He is a hardcore right-wing conservative who yeah. believes the federal government is a Trojan horse of tyranny. This is the political conversation at the Koch family dinner table. And Koch is also raised, Charles Koch is also raised to believe in hard work. How did the federal government pillage you today, Daddy? Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose so, right? And um, these are the ideas that are put into his head growing up. And then he kind of augments this kind of right-wing anti-communist uh, theory with these Austrian economists, Hayek and von Mises and all these people. And then he gets handed the keys to the family company in 1967 when his dad dies of a heart attack. So now he starts to shape the institution. In fact, it's his like obligation to start shaping the institution. And what I'm getting at is he develops, he, he's, he's, he's trying to think through, he's a total engineer. How do I do this? What, what is the blueprint mm -hmm. to do this? What are the actual rules? And he, I interviewed him about market-based management. And what he's telling me is, Chris, there are rules of physics in the world. The, I, and I'm stupid at physics, but like inertia and gravity and all that stuff. And he's saying, there are rules and laws that guide human behavior, and I've figured out what they are. And other people before me have figured out what they are. Von Mises figured out what it is in his book, Human Action. Hayek figured out what it is. And I've codified those rules into this philosophy called market-based management. And he's written several books about market-based management. He teaches it to his employees in internal uh, you know, focus groups and, and set and audit in the auditorium. You have these uh, teaching sessions they, about they it. They call it a university. They call it a university, Koch University. And to your original question, he says in his book, The Science of Success, there must be a, quote, total conversion. 
You're not halfway in and halfway out. You either obey the laws or you don't. You either understand it or you don't get it. And you've got to fully embrace it. And as I mentioned earlier, there's in Science of Success, I don't know what you call it, but these, it's a table. It's a table. And he's like, this is good for a company, it's good for a country, and it's good for your personal life. Like, this is an all-encompassing view of how the world ought to work. Well, just talk, talk all right, let's, let's break this down. Talk about, I, I just, obviously it's, it's much more significant how this applies to uh, country and, and company, but begin maybe by talking about how it applies to personal life. Well, you get back to these ideas of uh, personal responsibility, innovation, and entrepreneurship. How did it apply in his, how did he apply it in his own life? Like in terms of uh, oh, child rearing or um, <laughs> oh, gosh. personal so, discipline? Here's how I'll put it uh, before we talk about child rearing. On Sunday afternoons, Charles Koch brought his son and daughter into the family study and they listened to economic lectures on tape when they were toddlers. <laughs> so it's a, full thi- it's a full thing. How does this apply to Charles Koch? Um, there is, I'm not kidding, there's this spirit of, you, uh, in, your, in your piece about Bezos and Amazon, the word relentless mm-hmm. is something Bezos really focuses on. There's a total relentlessness to Charles Koch's belief that the market, the market is constantly probing for weakness. The market wants to destroy inefficient operations, and it wants to elevate innovative and efficient new operations. And if you slow down for a second, and if you get fat and lazy, and if you start to operate inefficiently, the market will tear you down. Mm-hmm. And you can fight it and complain and, and form things like Medicare and Social Security, but you're just fighting gravity. And the market will eventually have its way. And so when I think about Charles Koch, I do truly think about a relentless, exhausting day on a treadmill of, of always working to stay ahead of failure. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. What's fast? Well, you you said fear of failure there. It, it was it, the the one. What is um psychic psychologically? You have this guy who is, is kind of in this act of um, uh, constant creative destruction, con- perpetual revolution. Company revolutionizes itself several times over. Um, he's relentless when it comes to uh, constructing his political vision and influencing political economy to the ends that he deems um, ideal. Is there any torment underlying um, the way that he thinks about the world? Is there any, does he, is, is he somebody who's ever had a second thought or um, questioned anything about uh, his life? So, you know, first of all, I can't answer that. I'm a reporter on the outside. I don't know what goes on in his private moments. Well, you're no fun. I know, sorry. (laughs) But I'll give you an answer. Um, I mean, here's what what I do know. He doesn't project doubt. Uh, He doesn't... The people who work for him describe a kind of supremely unemotional character. He doesn't pound his hand on the desk. He doesn't curse. He doesn't yell. Uh, There are parts in the book where you see him irate and furious and angry. Uh, He waged a super ugly fight against his own brother, Bill, over the fight, over control of the company. I mean, the kind of stuff that just, I think, gnaws at a person until they die. I mean, really brutal inner family stuff. But he he projects an aura of, of determination and calm. And, you know, I asked him about the worst period of the company's history and his personal history of the 1990s. The company failed uh, in major business ventures. They racked up an incredible roster of criminal fines from the U.S. Department of Justice for pipeline leaks, uh, air pollution, uh, wanton water pollution that's documented in the book. It was a really hard time for the company. And I asked him how he dealt with it. And, I mean, of course, how honest is he going to be with the reporter? I don't know. But he told me, you know, I just saw the failures and I worked harder. Like, I sincerely believe he did not doubt the rules. 
Uh, he didn't doubt his own vision of the world. He didn't doubt his own competency. He just realized he'd made a mistake and he needed to get back to the grindstone and work harder. So I don't detect a lot of like uh, self-tortured um, doubt or self-interrogation uh, from him. Let's um, just, what was the moment like, so you interviewed him in what year? 2015. So relatively, was it, it was the book, had, had you conceived of the book by that point? Oh yeah. And what was, de describe the interview and describe meeting him and um, what was what was it like staring at this guy and, 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 and kind of meeting in the flesh and blood the person who would become the center of uh, your life for the next four years or yeah. whatever? Um, it, you know, as you know, as a reporter, it's always hard because you always want more. I, I You know, he and I met um, in a very... Uh, I was interviewing him for a story. There was a PR person sitting at the table right there. Did he know you were working on the book at that time? Yes. In fact, this is telling. Um, I conceived of the book and uh, wrote a profile of Coke for Fortune magazine when I was here at New America. And then I got a contract to do the book. And I mailed Charles Coke a letter. And I mailed his PR team a letter saying, I am, before the book was ever announced, I said, I'm writing a book about Coke Industries, and I want you to know before it's publicly announced. And one reason I did that is because they are so smart, and they're relentless researchers, and they knew a lot about me. And I knew that they were going to find out I was doing a book very, very quickly, and that if I wasn't totally transparent and straightforward, they would sense duplicity on my part. And I also just think it's good practice to let the subject know what you're doing. But I was more aggressive about it with Coke because I knew they would find out and they're very big on trust. What was the reaction? Silence. And then we can talk about this. Their PR team back then was very um, contentious and aggressive and in your face, which I actually kind of appreciated. They were very honest. And um, Missy Colmia, their PR person, sent me an email saying, I was very surprised to see someone refer to you as an expert on Coke Industries recently. <laughs> and I'm like, what can I say, Missy? People say what they say. But um, why did they give you they, they give the interview for the Fortune article or for the book? So they gave me interviews. Well, for the Fortune article, when I told them I was doing the article, they said, no way, we're not going to cooperate. We just have zero interest. Goodbye. And so I flew to Wichita, knocked on doors, started getting interviews. And as time went on, after a lot of contentious back and forth, they said, okay, fine. C come back. We'll give you like two interviews with two people that are key to the story. And they opened up a little bit. And it was sort of like that over a period of four and a half years of they would open doors and give access and then maybe close them again uh, when I was in the penalty box. And we'd go through the whole thing. And it goes back and forth like that. Uh, so, yeah. And... Um what was the like? It, it, look, let me let me pose the question this way: um, You spend all this time sitting and staring at Charles Koch, um, and to a lot of Americans of um, either uh, who are, who have a, of a liberal persuasion, he's the devil incarnate. Um, would you? Did you? Um, did you find him likable? After looking at him, were the things that you found yourself empathizing with or coming to appreciate that maybe others can't see? Yes, and so I realize I didn't answer your first question, what it was like to meet him. Okay, I'm going to just say this really quick. During that tough time in 2013, they wouldn't talk to me, and I just drove right up to the headquarters and walked into the lobby and said, come down and talk to me. You know, this is ridiculous. Well, that was 2013. Then they renovated the corporate headquarters. When I went back in 2015, part of the renovation was that the street I had driven on in on, a city street, they had torn up and at their own expense ran it in a horseshoe shape around the campus and built a 10-foot tall wall <laughs> around the corporate headquarters. Because legitimately, Charles Koch gets so many death threats, constant stream of death threats and vitriol, which I've seen on Twitter having done this book. And so it 
you know, it struck me that I got a security code emailed to my phone. I held it up to a scanner at a bunker. The steel gates open. I drove down a long road. Security escorted me up to his office building. I walk in. Here's one of the richest men on planet Earth, one of the most powerful men in America, I think it's fair to say. And, you know, he's kind of hunched over. He says, oh, hey, Chris, how are you doing? You didn't need to wear a tie to come talk to me, you know? And it's this instantly disarming Midwestern avuncular uh, personality that he projects. But it is deceptive in a way. It hides the backbone of, of a real fighter. The prologue of the book is about Charles Koch. It's kind of this overview. It's called The Fighter. I mean, he is absolutely convinced he knows how the world ought to work and how American society ought to be organized. And he is he's relentless in his fight to make that happen. So, you know, when I sat across from him, is there a lot I respect about him? Of course. And do I naturally feel um, a connection with another human being? Of course, you know. And he, he's, a, he's a brilliant, brilliant person who has a lot commendable about his leadership style, his long-term strategy, and his thinking. But there's also a lot more to the story about what his legacy is going to be and what the full impact of this... Um, corporation and, and the political operation is going to be, and not all of it's good. And, and the whole story isn't pretty. So, you know, all that stuff is swimming around in your head um, when you're around someone like that. But I guess to, to close, I mean, like on this comment, what struck me, truly struck me about that time with him, the one hour I had, was how much power he has. Um, it, he lives every day of his life at the apex of a globe-spanning corporate empire that's one of the most profitable in America that he has owned and operated since he was 32 years old. And virtually everybody he comes into contact with is beholden to him for a paycheck. Uh, the people in that firm, uh, you know, borderline worship this guy. And so that's the world he lives in every day. That's what struck me. Let's, let's go through the counterfactual. If... Charles Koch didn't exist, how would America be different? Okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm surprised at this answer. Uh, you know, the corporation uh, reflects deep realities about the American economy, okay, about how our political system and economic system works, but it's not like it transformed our life. Uh, Coke Industries did not invent the personal computer. They did not invent the automobile. They run the machinery that makes life work. But if there was no Charles Koch, I think a lot of the stuff about our life would be the same. I really do think at the end of the day, after looking at this for years, I'd say the biggest impact uh, they've had is on American politics. And when I started reporting on their political apparatus, all of the reporting pointed me in one direction, and that's the issue of climate change and carbon regulations. That's what they care about. That's what got them up every day. They have been unique in their approach to this issue. They've been uniquely uncompromising and militant to not only derail any effort to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, but to cast doubt on the very science behind climate change. What I'm telling, what I'm saying is, w if there was no Charles Koch, a key thing that would be different, and I feel comfortable saying this, is the politics around climate change. So, can you just, let's just, let's just dig in on this because it seems, it's, I mean, obviously it's so important. Um, contrast Koch's approach that, to dealing with um, cap and trade and uh, the various other regulatory questions with, say, Exxon's approach. If, if you didn't have Coke there staking this uncompromising position, would the rest of industry have maybe folded under the pressure to make a deal? Um, it, would, we be, would, we actually have, would we actually be in a different place with climate now if he wasn't sitting there at the vanguard of the anti-regulatory denialist movement? Great question. 
um, and, and, and I'm thinking about a lot of this stuff. I, to me, one of the central battlefields over this issue was in 2010 when the Democrats in Congress wanted to pass the Waxman-Markey bill, cap and trade. They were close. And the other fossil, and this has never been an easy lift. You've, I'm sure you've read the Nathaniel Rich book, Losing Earth, which is about climate change debates back in the 70s or 80s. It's not like this was an easy lift. It was never going to be an easy lift to do something about this problem which is so deeply embedded in just modern life, you know, uh, producing greenhouse gases, okay? But Exxon, Chevron, Valero, big, big players in this fossil fuel space were playing ball, okay? They weren't embracing climate change legislation, but a lot of them realized this is going to happen. Let's manipulate the law to work as as well as it can for us. Let's make this so it's a hospitable future for fossil fuels and we can continue to make money even if uh, greenhouse gas emissions go down or we have to pay a price for putting carbon into the sky. And the book documents that. Uh, the, and and ExxonMobil, some people say that they're playing a little game by supporting a carbon tax and they're just trying to forestall legislation. But they are on the record saying, we think this should happen and we will support it. Coke was a different animal entirely. And a lot of it traces back to this fact of what we've been talking about. Charles Koch has a set view of how the world should work. And you can't argue with a blueprint. You can't say, ah, I don't want the laws of physics to apply here, only here. And so when they came to Washington on this issue of climate change, they approached it in a stunningly uh, militant, uncompromising fashion. Uh, and, and they helped burn to the ground that moderate wing of the Republican Party that wanted to do something about this. They infused cap-and-trade rhetoric into the Tea Party. They helped reshape Republican politics so that when someone with a very good ear for politics like Donald Trump comes along, he's talking about cap and, uh, climate change being a hoax and, and the Chinese are behind it and solar power gives you cancer. He, he's, he's responding to the, the sound waves that Koch was putting out back in 2010 and the way they've reshaped the Republican Party. So, I, I mean, my answer to you is I think Koch is quantitatively different from the other big oil companies. I think a lot of that has to do with that they're privately held and Charles Koch is in control. And I think that they've had uh, an outsized effect on this issue. We'll open it up, I think. And uh, let me just ask you one more question, which is uh, I said that there were two central characters in the book. Yeah. The second, I think, is capitalism, American capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, what, as you, as you studied the American economy through the lens of Coke Industries, what did you learn about capitalism? What's, what do you want the reader to take away about the second subject? Oh, man. Thank you. That is a great question. Um, capitalism uh, is like Frankenstein's monster. It's something that we create. It is not handed down. It is not an organism that evolves independently. Uh, it is a, a human-created system of rules. That's all capitalism is. And it's, I mean, I guess it's a beautiful thing, I think. Um, it's one, it, 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 when done right, it creates opportunity, liberty, individual sovereignty, and all these amazing things. It's a great way for people to coordinate together. You hear a lot about that in the Koch rhetoric. It's, it's an incredible way for humans to uh, operate together. S looking back, okay, from 1900 to 2019, uh, the, the picture I took away mm -hmm. is that when left alone, capitalism kind of wants to revert to a mean. And that's a mean where you've got kids working in coal mines, workplace injuries, tainted meat, uh, environmental pollution, massive corruption in politics, and uh, profound income inequality. And that's what America was like in 1900, straight up. And then there was a public policy response to that uh, in the 1930s and 40s that regulated financiers, controlled the power of monopolies, empowered labor unions, and as you and I were talking about earlier, labor unions sure aren't perfect. And when they were at the peak of their power, they sure weren't perfect. But 
it's not coincidental that when they were most dominant in American life is when income was most broadly shared, that productivity and wage gains went side by side. That's, I just find it hard to believe that's coincidental. Um, and that whole system that was built in the 30s and 40s fell apart in the 70s. And it wasn't just because of a cabal of right-wing people who destroyed it. There were like fundamental problems underlying it. It was a really complicated thing. But now we live in an era where the economy is, is, is leaving a decade of growth. A decade of growth. And unemployment is at a level where it hasn't been since the 1960s. And, you know, you just know this doesn't feel like the 1960s to people. It just doesn't. And the reason why is because the economy can grow for 10 years. The gains are captured by a small group of people. Most people are treading water economically and fixing the hole with debt. It's, it, that's exactly what's happened over the last decade. So my lesson about American capitalism is that it's a wonderful system it has to be tinkered with constantly like a refinery, um, and that when you don't tinker with it, it can break down, and when it breaks down, the consequences are really bad. All right, let's open it up. Hi, uh, Alex Stark, New America. Um, I'm almost finished reading the book, and it's, it's a really wonderful read. It's hard to put down sometimes, so uh, thank you. Um, my question is about, so oftentimes when you describe Charles Koch and the sort of senior people around him, he seems so logical and methodical in everything he does and very rational. And that's almost across the board except when it comes to climate change. And then all of a sudden <laughs> you hear people in the book saying things that I, I didn't think that they actually believed, like it's all a hoax, it doesn't matter, you know, we don't have to do anything about this because it's not real. Um, and I, I know, of course, this has to do with his management philosophy and so forth, but I, and I'm asking you maybe to peer into someone's mind in a way that you can't, but did you get a sense of how he and those folks around him kind of square this idea of there's the scientific evidence about this thing that's happening and, you know, fighting cap and trade might be good for our short-term bottom line, but in the long run for our business, for, you know, our kids, this could be really devastating. Yeah. Thank you. So my answer is so unsatisfying because I don't have an answer. And you're asking questions I hear all the time and that I was asking. I have sent multiple requests to Coke Industries to let me sit down with Charles Coke. I have sent l the list of questions I have, and they're exactly what you just asked. Here's a person with three master's degrees in engineering from MIT, one of them being nuclear engineering. He understands data. He understands science. Where does he come down on this? Um, okay. I don't know. He won't answer that question to me. Um, now, here's what I do know. We've recorded their footprint. We've recorded what they've done in the world through the lobbying, uh, through their think tanks, and they have done what we just talked about earlier, which is derail efforts to regulate greenhouse gases. Is it because they think the science is fake? Is it because they think a market solution will emerge and that by regulating the energy industry, we're only going to create massive problems that will forestall that market solution? Is it a totally cynical effort to protect the future profits of the company? The cost to Coke Industries from a cap on carbon emissions or a price on carbon emissions over 50 years is measured in a T, in trillions of dollars. And I can walk through that whole thing, and I've published that, and I've printed it, and Coke can't dispute it, and hasn't disputed it, because uh, it, it, you look at the value of the assets they have in the fossil fuels business, and then the future value of those assets as oil flows through them, and if oil prices fall, and if demand falls, the losses are just huge. So there is a clear economic interest there. Um, you know, the only other data I have is I was interviewing uh, Philip Ellender, their top lobbyist here in Washington, D.C. in 2014, and he was telling me, we're not so sure about the science of climate change. And I was interviewing a former senior executive at Coke, a very, very smart person, who I think totally sincerely believes the whole climate change thing is a, a massive hoax cooked up by universities and governments to cow the population into accepting tyranny. And he was like, 
you know, shaking his head. Chris, how can you be so um, seduced by this lie? <laughs> you know, how can you believe this? And I think he was being sincere with me. So at the end of the day, you know, I talked about how Charles Koch live, lives in the middle of an empire he created. There probably aren't a lot of people aggressively questioning this. In fact, the book features on the record a former senior compliance attorney at Koch named David Hoffman who did question this stuff and, and created an internal think tank to figure out how to adapt to a cap-and-trade uh, regulated carbon world and, and was kind of forced out of the company, certainly was ignored on that topic and told me they, they accept challenging views but not on this topic. So maybe what you can see is a snowball building over decades where the challenging information is minimized and the supporting information is emphasized. Um, but look, at the end of the day, I'm an outside reporter uh, looking into a dark glass window. And I don't know what they really believe in their heart about the issue, but we can say what they've done about it. So. Hi, Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, CEO here. And Chris, first of all, we're just enormously proud of this book. Yeah. And Thanks. It's wonderful to hear you. So my question is, are there any women in the story at all? Are there any sisters? Are there any wives? Are there any senior women? I mean, it's just actually extraordinary to hear you talk. And the only woman's name I've heard is the PR person. So I just wonder, inside the Koch family, were there any women? Presumably you had a mother, but anybody else? Wow. So the demographic diversity inside Coke Industries has not been tremendous over the decades. That is for sure. And there are very, very few women in this book. Uh, it is uh, extraordinarily dominated by not just conservative white men, but conservative white men of a certain type who thrive in the company, who help lead the company. Um, so and, and there is one woman in the book I really would like to talk about. But there were no sisters. There's no Koch sister. Uh, there were four Koch brothers. And the father, you know, encouraged them to box with each other and compete with each other. And there were lots of King of the Hill games. There's a lot of competition and um, aggression there. And even physical. And so, um, I, I, I do, you know, there's a daughter... Charles Koch has a daughter and a son, and they were both brought into the family study to listen to the economic lectures, and the daughter was the eager pupil, and the son told me he would fall asleep with a ball cap over his eyes, but the son is in line to take over the company, and the daughter uh, runs a publishing house in New York City. So, and Leslie Rudd, a close friend of the family, said, look, this was Wichita in the 70s. The son came in behind the father. That's a very real cultural thing. Um, one of my favorite chapters in the entire book is called The Secret Brotherhood of Process Owners. And it's about a woman named Heather Farragher who went to work at a Coke refinery in Pine Bend, Minnesota. And her bosses began to break the law by dumping ammonia-laden water into nearby wetlands because the refinery wasn't working well. They were producing all this pollution. They had the choice to put it into the river where it would be detected and they would bust their permit and face fines, or they could dump it out the back into the nearby wetlands. And she sent them um, all documented, all totally documented. She sent memos saying, you can't do this. She told them verbally, you can't do this. She would leave for the weekend. They would do it over the weekend. She'd come back Monday and they'd tell her she did it. She ended up cooperating with federal authorities and they were given a record uh, fine for that and found guilty, essentially even though it didn't go to court. It was a very interesting story because it, it, I loved that chapter because it talks about whistleblowers and it talks about how difficult it is inside a corporation to stand up and say no. And um, it can't be coincidental, the gender issues that are there. She told me that the compliance hotline attorney told her she was being too emotional and should... Literally, she told me, he said, you know, you should take care of your family. So I think that there was an issue of people not being listened to. And, and, and this look, this all ties back, in my view, to uh, sort of 
homogeny uh, and corporate group think and how difficult it can be to stand up against it. Um, and I guess my final closing thought, uh, and I hope I've answered the question there, I'm, you know, there are just not many women in the book, but it does describe a significant like institution in, in our system. And there's real conformity here. One of my favorite things was I found a picture of the Coke cafeteria back in the 70s, and everybody's wearing a white shirt, sport coat, and a tie. And then Charles Koch decided in the 90s, ties are not working, they're too formal, and then you see the same picture of him sitting there with no tie, and everyone behind him is no tie, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, uh, there, uh, yeah, it's, it's a homogenous, in many ways, a homogenous organization. Thanks. Oh, you should. Hi. Um, uh, in terms of the actual makeup of the business, the, the, the corporate structure, so oil always at the heart of it. Um, in terms of like percentage terms, has that changed over time, or is it really oil at the core and then profitable bits on the sides? Thank you so much for asking that. Um, and, and I should have gotten into that more when I described the company. Starts in oil. And oil is the bread and butter bedrock of this firm. Oil refineries, pipelines, and trading has always been at the core. Um, and then they're very smart about how they expand and grow. This is a company always looking to expand and grow. But they branch out from what they know. Okay, so they branch out from oil refinery to liquid natural gas processing plants, which are like oil refineries. And then they break out from there into natural gas pipelines, and from there into trading electricity, which is highly contingent on natural gas prices. So you can see how the thing branches out into the world, constantly growing, but doesn't grow in the sense that they don't sell TVs, they don't sell T-shirts, they don't make movies. They do these certain kinds of businesses. So it's very difficult to measure what Coke Industries is today because they're privately held and they jealously guard that. I think what I can tell you is that still about 55% of their sales every year comes from just Flint Hills resources, crude oil. And that's probably wrong now because it fluctuates year to year, but that's not probably, it's a good ballpark. And then they have a huge chunk that does nitrogen fertilizer, which again is just natural gas. That's all it is. And then after that, you, you've got Georgia Pacific, which is paper, building materials. Uh, and so these would make up the minor um, components. But nitrogen fertilizer, Georgia Pacific, then the small little suite of companies like Molex, which makes those phone sensors, uh, Guardian Glass, which makes the glass uh, in buildings, and then a very troubled division called Invisto, which is what makes the clothing materials. It's never really been that profitable. Hi, uh, I'm Mukund. I work in criminal defense in, in uh, the city. Um, so it's a really great book, uh, and I'll just say that, like, throughout your descriptions of the details of, like, how an oil refinery works, I never thought I'd be interested in reading about that. <laughs> but I found myself pretty, um, you know, the chapter three on the war on Pine Bend is really fascinating. Um, so I was very impressed with that. <laughs> My question is, um, does Coke, do, do Coke and Coke Industries faithfully apply market-based management? Um, where, where do you see that being faithfully applied, or where do you see them falling short of applying those principles? Okay. And first of all, I'm going to tell my editor exactly what you said about that chapter in Pine Bank, because we had a lot of fights about that. But my, my theory is, like, I want readers to really feel empowered. And I want you to, uh, or I, I, I really like when books teach me about the machinery. And so that when you're having a conversation about this stuff, you you can talk about it, you know, and talk back. And that's really great. And so I'm glad you were as fascinated about that stuff as I was. So then how is market-based management applied, and is it applied consistently? I'll, I'll, I'll answer this honestly, and this is how I see it. I think it is a constantly moving target. It's got this set of principles. They've got worksheets to go through before you make an acquisition. Uh, there's a definite vocabulary to it. To me, the major power of market-based management is very significant and serious. It unifies the workforce. When you've got a company spread across the globe in all these different industries, market-based management gets everybody speaking the same language, working under the same incentives, and marching to the same tune. That can't be overstated. That's hard to do. I've covered a lot of companies. And having a unified corporate culture is really hard. But in the sense that it's applied 
uh, like an actual blueprint equally in each division, I have found it tends to be a moving target so that when somebody fails, they weren't doing it right. And when someone succeeds, they were doing it right. And um, it's arbitrary in my view. And I'm sure Coke would like massively dispute that, say I got it all wrong, didn't observe the right things. And, but that's my takeaway point, is that it's mostly a cultural thing. And of course, there are uh, important nuggets in it, in terms of how you think about the markets you're trading in, for example, and how you buy another company. But um, at the end of the day, it, it, it did seem to be a moving target, if you will. Have and you, have you heard ahead. from Coke at all? Uh, anybody in Coke about the book? Um, so, no. We, uh, the book came out August 13th. Back up to February 1st, I gave them 260 pages of material from the book, uh, fact-checking memos, with an emphasis on everything bad. Here's everything critical. Here's everything that might upset you. Let's talk about it. We went through that for months. They engaged in a totally good faith effort with me. Um, we had a constructive dialogue. It got heated at the end as we got down to the final issues um, and it got pretty heated at the end when we kind of had different views of things. And then when the book came out, it has been total radio silence. Nothing to refute. Um. <laughs> Congratulations again. Thanks. Really, thank All you. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody.